We've been talking about money. Maybe that's why everybody decided to take a vacation. <laughs> as, I said, as I said last week, when, I, when, I, when, I, when God gives me to preach about money, it's never because we need more. I never preach about money because I have to. And I don't have to now. And I said that last week, and I want to reiterate that to those who might not have been here or not have heard the message. Some, a lot of people think that when a preacher gets up and starts preaching about money and giving, it's because that they, uh, you know, the church is hurting. But we're not. We're not. We're all right. Last week we talked about the attitudes that we have when it comes to giving. Uh, when, you, when you give, you know, without expecting to receive, there's a risk there. There's a risk there. If you give something away, that means you don't have it anymore. Now, let's face it, we all like to have stuff. And, and a lot of us like to hold on to stuff. And sometimes we like to hoard stuff. But when you give something away, you don't have it anymore. And, and there's, a, there's an attitude. We want to look at an example this morning that we find in God's Word about what it means to be, what we mentioned last week, a cheerful giver. Or a hilarious giver. Okay. Uh, I was reading some statistics. And it says that in the United States of America, people that make over $100,000 a year, on the average, people that make over $100,000 a year give about 2.7% of their income to charitable givings, on the average. And that, you know, if you make a lot of money, that could add up to a lot of money. This is that people that make $25,000 a year or less give about 4.7%, the higher percentage. People, it seems that people that have less give more, percentage-wise. Last week, our brother brought up the scripture about the widow with the two mites, who she gave, percentage-wise, she gave a whole lot more than, the, you know, than the, the, the wealthy folks did. And it's a matter of being willing. Maybe there's, maybe there's a... There's an empathy. You can sense if, you, if, if you're hurting and you know somebody's hurting and you know somebody is doing without and you're willing to share because you've done without. How many of us have been in a situation one time or another where we've had to do without and when we hear somebody in that position, if, you, if you're making a ton of money, you, you don't have to do without. You've got. And you don't know what it feels like if you don't know where the electric bill is going to come from. You don't know if you're going to have a place to live next month or so forth. And I think there's a there's a, there's a compassion there. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, we read about Paul was taking an offering. Paul was taking, he, and Paul wasn't ashamed to take an offering, by the way. We had said last week, you know, in this church we don't pass a basket, we have an offering box, and we, we like to, you know, encourage people to pray over their offerings when they bring it, and we talked about that, but Paul was taking an offering. And there basically, there's two kinds of offerings. Now, again, this isn't, these kinds of messages aren't really shouting messages, but they're important because they have to deal with your relationship with God. There are two kinds of offerings. There's a storehouse offering where you bring your offering to the storehouse. We call it tithes or offerings. You bring your offerings to the church because every, every congregation, every church needs money to subsist. In the Old Testament, God made a way for the offerings to come in to the priest, some of the offerings would be given completely to God and offered on the altar. Some of them, they would keep some for themselves and put some on the altar and so forth. And there were different, there were different uh, uh, ways of splitting up that offering, some for the ministry and some for God himself. Uh, today, there's a store, and we call it a storehouse offering. People bring tithes and offerings to support the work of, of the congregation, to upkeep the building and, and buy stuff. We got stuff that costs money. And, you know, to try to fix steps and fix roofs and things like that and pay the bills and have heat and have electricity. So that's a storehouse. And also to minister to people that need, too, because that's a, that's a, that's a part of the, the storehouse. To have stuff. If somebody comes and says, hey, uh, you know, I have a need, we'll be able to minister to their need. That's a storehouse offering. Another offering is, is like an outreach offering. And those offerings are like missions. We'll talk about that tonight a little bit. Offering to missions, to foreign missions and local missions. Uh, uh, giving to people, you know, almsgiving, if you know somebody that needs a hand and so forth, that's another kind of offering. God honors all those kinds of offerings if they're done with the right attitude. Last week we talked about attitude. 
And, and, and you have to have both. You know, some people will take from one and give to the other, but that kind of defeats the purpose. We need to be willing to share whenever the opportunity arises. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, let's just read a little bit. Paul was writing to this church of Corinth. And of course, we know that, or well, we've spoken before about the situation in Corinth. Cor Corinth was a very wealthy city in the southern part of Greece. It was a poor city. A lot of money in Corinth. And the Apostle Paul was talking to the church of Corinth about raising an offering to help the Christians in Jerusalem. Now, according to present day, you know, uh, prosperity theology, we would think that the church in Jerusalem should have been rich and wealthy, and, but they were struggling. They were under intense persecution from the Jews. They had uh, experienced a lot, of, uh, a lot of challenges in their existence there in Jerusalem because they were considered, the Jews looked upon the church as just a bunch of, as like a cult that broke off from, you know, a bunch of Jewish crazy cult people. And, and they were being persecuted by the Jewish leaders at that point. In other parts of the world, the, the, the church was being persecuted. The Jews persecuted them as a cult. And the Gentiles thought they were just a bunch of nuts. And uh, so they had all kinds of crazy ideas, just like today. You know, people have crazy ideas about Christianity. So the Christians of those days would struggle so much. So Paul was raising an offering for the church in Jerusalem. And listen to what he says in verse 8. Uh, chapter 8 and verse 1, I'm sorry. Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. He's referring now to uh, the body of Christ that existed in Macedonia, which is in the northern part of Greece. If you look on the current map of that area, you'll see Macedonia is still there. It's a place where they had like the uh, 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 city of Philippi, uh, Thessalonica. If you read about that in the book of Acts, that's in the northern part of Greece. Macedonia. Okay. Now, it says how that, verse 2, as the, an example of giving the church in Macedonia, he says how that in a great trial of affliction and abund the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. And that's kind of a sort of a twisted sentence to us, you know, in 2011. But here's what he's saying. This church in Macedonia, they were going through a severe trial. They, they weren't, you know, on the front cover of Time magazine. They weren't being lifted up as like the latest, greatest thing. They were being persecuted. They were going through a severe trial. They were getting it from the Jews. They were getting it from the Romans. It was, and, 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 every, and the people thought they were crazy. Yet even in their persecution, they could have wrung their hands and said, Oh God, why is this happening to us? They desired... To make an offering to the church of Jerusalem. It was their desire. Uh, it says that they had an abundance of joy. Even in their persecution. They had an abundance of joy. Can we have joy when things are coming against us? It's hard to do that, isn't it? When it seems like the whole world is turning against you, it's hard to be joyful. But this church in Macedonia, Paul's holding them up as an example of a church, a group of Christians, that even though they were receiving official persecution, they had abundant joy. It also said that because of all these conditions, they were living in deep poverty. Now again, according to modern day theology, that's, they must have been out of God's will. They must have been sinners. They must have not been doing what God uh, wanted them to do because they were in poverty. The fact is that they were struggling and suffering because of their faith. They were being persecuted and they tried to squeeze them out of existence because of their faith. They passed zoning ordinances that said they couldn't have church. Okay. He says, How that in the great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality or their, or their simplicity. Verse 3. For to their power I bear record, yes, and beyond their power they were willing of themselves. They went above and beyond what they were able to do. They struggled. They, they tried to, to just outdo anything that anybody thought they could, could do as a, as, as a body. To support this church in Jerusalem. To meet the needs of the people in Jerusalem. The, the brothers and sisters that were struggling. They had a desire to meet that need. 
They were going above and beyond what was expected of them. Okay. He goes on and he says this. Verse 4. Praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering of the saints. They begged Paul to let them help. Paul probably said, hey, listen, man, you guys are struggling. That's okay. You know, don't, it's all right. You don't have to give us all this much. But they said, no, please let us. Now, ask yourself this. Have you ever had a yearning and a desire to give for a cause? Most of the time, when we're, you know, we ask to give for a cause, it's like, oh, I've got to get out for... But these believers, they were hungering to help their fellow believers in Jerusalem. They had a desire. They didn't have it to give. They had to scrimp and, and, and save, but they wanted to... It, they counted it an honor to be able to bless somebody. Now, I want, to, I want to say this, and I want you to understand as we read on. When we talk about giving and talk about money, there's purpose and responsibility. Purpose and responsibility. We don't just take our money and just say, here. Here. Do what you want. Here. Money. We give because, well, I want to support a missionary in Africa. Or we give because, well, I want to give some extra money to help the church, you know, here. Or uh, I'm going to give some extra money to, the, to these people who are hurting. We always have a purpose. We should have a purpose. When we bring our offering and, and tithes and offerings to this box, it's, it's to bless, Lord, I want, I want to support the work here. I want to, there's a reason for me putting my money. I'm not just throwing it in because it's some kind of duty. There's a purpose. These Christians in Macedonia, they had a purpose. They wanted to bless the church in Jerusalem. It's a purpose. And not only is there a purpose, there's a responsibility. There's a, a responsibility of the people receiving the offering to do with it what they say they're going to do. See, that's the problem that we have today. There's a lot of people taking offerings. that They say, I'll take an offering for, for point A, but when I get it, I'm going to use it for B. They'll take an offering and take you know, 60% out of it for administrative costs. And the other 40 hits, maybe, where it's supposed to go. See, if you come and you put your offering in this box, you don't give it unto me, you give it unto the Lord. It's up to me and the, and the, and the money people of this church to make sure that we do with that money what we say we're going to do with it. If you, if you give money to somebody and they do something wrong with it and you don't know about it, that's not on you, you gave it unto God. But if you give money to somebody and they do something wrong with it and you hear about it and you give them more money, that's on you. <laughs> we have a responsibility. It's a purpose. We purpose to give our money for a reason and we have a responsibility to do everything within us to make sure it's going to be used for what it says it's going to be used for. And for those who receive the offering, we're going to read here in a little bit, we want to make sure it's going to go to where it's supposed to go. Because, you know, money has a, a funny way sometimes of finding different paths. Okay. <laughs> Let's read a little bit more. He says, I hate messages like this because they're so quiet. You know, you always want to come to church on Sunday and, and, and leave jumping, but, you know, these, it's just it's a jumping mess. Okay. Okay. <laughs> And uh, let's look at verse 4 again. Praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. He said, he, he, giving of their stuff, it was like giving of themselves. They prayed. You ought to pray about where you put your money. You ought to pray about where you give money. Pray, ask God, God, do you want me to support this? But I'm not afraid to say that. Before you put money in this box, you ought to pray about it. You ought to pray, Lord, do you want me to put my money in that box? So I ain't afraid to say that because I know, I know what God wants us to do, what he's called us to do. Before you send money to somebody on TV, on the radio, you ought to pray about it. Because there's some folks on there. Sounds good, looks good. But when you start digging deep, I told you the story about we were we were supporting a we were supporting a guy, and he was a good guy, good preacher, seemed to be. And we had a month where we we went so far in the hole it wasn't even funny. 
I was looking at, I, I, I told the story a couple weeks ago or last week, I can't remember what it was, but we looked at, we looked at, we looked at the report. I looked at, the, you know, the, 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 the monthly thing, you know, the spreadsheet like you, put, you print out, the you know, money you got coming and going out. I looked at that and I said, man, where did all this money go? You ever have, you ever have a month like that? You said, where in the world did the money go? When I have a month like that, the first thing I do is I say, God, what have I done? Because, <laughs> you know, I found something out. When you, when, when you don't listen to God, he he'll, has a way of getting your attention. If you don't listen to God, he has a way of getting your attention. So, so I, you know, we had this, we had the, you know, I looked at the spreadsheet that month. It was a couple years ago. I looked at that spreadsheet and I said, my Lord, what, what in the world is going on here? Lord, are we, set, are we putting your money somewhere where it doesn't belong? Five minutes, I got a phone call. It was five minutes. Oh, honest to goodness. I was sitting on my desk over, over my house. I was looking at that and just shaking my head. And the phone rang. And a name, that guy's name was on the phone. I picked it up and there was somebody there that didn't even know what was going on. And he mentioned that guy's name. I said, okay, I can take a hint. <laughs> I don't know why God didn't want us to support. He's a good guy. I've had him speak here once or twice since then, but it's, it, we were doing monthly support, and God, it was like God saying, stop supporting him. I don't know why. But God knows why. So I just had to be obedient to God. I didn't even argue with him. I said, well, okay. <laughs> See, God will have a way of letting you know. He'll, he'll make you, he wants you to be responsible for where you put your money. He wants us as a church to be responsible for what we do with the funds. As I said a few weeks ago, we take the money that we got come in, we take a percentage of that, and it goes back out. It goes to ministries, local ministries, world missions. It goes to different places. But I want to make sure it's going to where God wants it to go. We need to pray. When we decide we're going to send money to something, we need to pray. When you decide to send money, put money in this box or send money to some minister somewhere, you need to pray and say, God, do you want me to take what you have given me and share it with this individual or this ministry. And God will let you know. He'll let you know. It's better to pray first <laughs> before you have the bad mind. Okay. All right. Reading a little bit more. Okay. Look at verse 7. It says, Therefore, as you abound in everything, in faith and utterance and knowledge, and in all diligence and in your love to us, see that you abound in this grace also. See, the church at Corinth was doing pretty well for itself. If you read through the 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, they had a lot of problems, but they seemed to be doing fairly well for themselves. They seemed to be established, and they had stuff to share. He says, listen, you've abounded, you, you have faith, you, you, you know, the Spirit is moving, the Word is going forth, there's knowledge, you have diligence, you have love, See that you abound in this grace also. It seems, from reading this, that the church at Corinth had made a promise to take an offering for the church of Jerusalem. And it seems like that promise had somehow gotten misplaced. Have you ever done that? Have you, have you ever made a promise? Have you ever told God, well, yeah, Lord, I'm going to... And a day goes past, and a week goes past, and a month goes past, and a few months go past. And Paul is reminding the church at Corinth, he said, do you remember when you purposed in your heart to lift an offering to help the saints in Jerusalem? Maybe it's time you kind of remind yourself about what you said you were going to do. Let's read on a little bit more. It says, verse 8, I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of others and to prove the sincerity of your love. Paul says, I want to test. You, you have knowledge. You have wisdom. You say you have love. Let's find out what your love is. It's called the acid test. Have you ever heard of that acid test? When they, when they get gold, they, there's a kind of acid they put on it to see just how pure it is. Paul says, I want to see how pure your love is. I said this last week, my good friend Harold Malise says all the time, if you want to know a person's spirituality, look at their Bible and look in their wallet. Or look at their checkbook. Because true faith carries works. James said it. He said, what good is it, my brother, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such a faith save him? 
Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, hey, hey, be blessed. Go in peace. And he still don't have clothes or food? He says, if you've got something to give them, instead of telling them to be blessed, why don't you bless them? See, true faith will give you a heart to want to bless somebody if they have a need, if you have what they have, if you have what they need. Okay? That's true faith. There's a lot of people who say have faith, but they're not going to give nothing unless they think they're going to get a 30, 60, 100 fold return. Paul didn't say nothing about that here. Not yet, anyway. Listen to what he says. Verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became what? Poor. Philippians chapter 2 is a wonderful passage to remember. It talks about how Jesus, while he was equal with God, was willing to let go of his equality with God. He never stopped being God. The Son of God never stopped being deity. But what he was willing to do was he was willing to step out of heaven and step into this. He was willing to get off the throne and step into one of these bodies like ours. He was willing to come from his throne of glory and be born in a manger. He was willing to give everything for us. Though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, that you might, through his poverty, become rich. Jesus lived a common life of a common man, a working man. He didn't have great wealth. He was just an ordinary, everyday nobody. Until the ministry started. And then he began to preach. And even then he didn't have a place to lay his head. This is, the, this is the creator of the universe. This is the Lord of glory. Paul said, if he's willing to do that for you, what are you willing to do for somebody else? Verse 10. And here is, I give my advice. Old Paul giving some advice here. For this is expedient for you who have begun before not only to do but also to be forward a year ago. He said, you know, a year ago you said you were going to take this offering. Maybe it's time that you carry through. I wonder if in your life, a year ago, ten years ago, a few months ago, you told God you were going to do something. This is not talk even about offerings. This is talk in general. Have you ever made a promise to God? Maybe not money. Maybe you told God you were going to go here or do this or, or quit this or in a, a week, in a month, in a year. It's not good to make a promise to God and not keep it. God expects us to keep His promises to Him. You know that? Isn't that something? Do you expect your loved ones to keep their promises to you? Do you think God expects that of us? Paul said... I want you to do this. Verse 11. Now therefore, perform the doing of it, that as there was a readiness to will, so there may, uh, may be a performance also out of that which you have. Good intentions mean nothing. It's what we do. And that, that doesn't just go for money. That doesn't just go for giving. It goes for everything. What we mean to do well. Well, we could get off on something. Stop talking about money and start talking about real stuff. We mean to do well. There's an old saying, it's not in the Bible, but it's pretty true. The road to hell is paved with what? Good intentions. What we mean to do and what we say we're going to do. Well, I'm going to make that phone call. See, I've got to get a little convicted here. I'm going to make that phone call. God says, don't you think it's about time you make that phone call? I'm going to go visit. Don't you think it's about time? How, how many people, you don't have to put your hand up, how many people here right now are sitting here under a promise you've made that you've not fulfilled? Not just about money. About anything. See, now we go to meddling. It's one thing. I can talk about money. You can shrug that off. But now I'm talking about <laughs> purported stuff. He says this. Verse 12. 
For if there be first a willing mind, it is accepted according to that a man has, and not according to that a man has not. For I mean not that other men be eased and you burdened, but by an equality that now at this time your abundance may be a supply for their want, that their abundance also may be a supply for your want, that there may be equality. He's saying, listen, we're all in this together. I don't expect anybody, some people will go over and above just like the church of Macedonia did, but he's not expecting us to do anything that we're not able to do. And what he gives us, he expects us to use. He says, as it is written, he that has gathered much had nothing over, and he that had gathered little had no lack. But thanks be to God, which put the same earnest care into the heart of Titus for you. For indeed, he accepted the exhortation, but being more forward of his own accord, he went unto you. And we have sent with him the brother whose praise is in the gospel throughout all the churches. And not that only, but who was also chosen of the churches to travel with us with this grace which is administered by us to the glory of the same. He sent Titus to that church to lift that offering. Titus was a trusted fellow laborer. He said, I sent Titus to remind you guys and to lift this offering so that you could fulfill what you said you were going to do. He says, you know what? And now, now, here's, now here's a principle. If you sow little, you're going to reap little. You know, if you go out and you plant three, to, three tomato seeds, you'll get three tomato plants. But if you plant a hundred seeds... Well, if you're like me, you'll still get, only get three tomato plants. But it's just the principle. The more you give, the more God is going to be willing to give you to give. We don't give so we can get stuff. See, that's, that's the current day thinking. That's what they use to try to get you to send money, you know, call in and put it on your credit card. That's what they use to try to get you to, you know, send the offering. You know, well, if you, if you put so much in, you'll get, you know, the 30, 60, 100, blah, 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 full. That's not the purpose. The purpose is this. We bless God and God blesses us. It might not be with the same amount of money. It might not even be with money. It could be with anything. God can bless us in a lot of different ways other than money. It's not about stuff. It's not about the spreadsheet. It's about ministry, attitude, love. He says, in verse 19, he's talking about the, the servant that he sent in Titus. And he said this, verse 20, avoiding this that no man should blame us in this abundance which is administered by us. You see, Paul made himself accountable. Accountable. He sent Titus. He sent the other servant to be able to take this offering. Because if Paul didn't want to go just and take it himself, because he was afraid somebody might accuse him of taking it and taking a vacation on the Riviera. See, this is why in any, in any organization, whether it be a denominational or independent, the people that do the money are accountable. We put out, every, every year I send out the, the receipts, you know, if, if you put in, send out the receipts, and I say, you got any questions, come see us. I'll show anybody, anybody that wants to see the books of this church, I'll take them down and say, I'll show them to them. I won't show them what people give, that's your business, that's, that's private. I won't show individual giving records. If anybody wants to see where the money comes and goes in this church, we'll go downstairs and look at spreadsheets. sheets, I'll show you. Myself and, and, and John and Chuck, we do the money. We're accountable. We'll show you where the money goes. I just don't have one big old bank account. I put it in my pocket. You know. it, there's accountability. Responsibility. Accountability. See, all this is involved in giving. The priests in the Old Testament, they were required. God gave them rules how they had to use the stuff that they got through the offering. Paul goes on and he talks about Titus and how they were diligent to use the stuff that God gave them the way God went unto you. I want to ask you this this morning. Where are you in your relationship with God when it comes to supporting His ministry? Not just in this church, not just in this congregation. 
Many of you are very faithful in doing that. That's really not, that's between you and God. But I want to ask you this morning, see, this is, this is a, a dry altar call. Because a lot of altar calls are really like emotionally, oh, you know. This is a dry one. This one isn't emotionally charged. This one isn't repentance and crying out to God, oh, God. Not on the surface, anyway. But I want to ask you this morning, where are you in your relationship with God? You may, you, you may never put a penny in that box. You may never come back to this church. It doesn't matter. It's you and the Lord. Where are you with God when it comes to your stuff? Jesus said, what does it profit a man to gain his life and lose his soul? Oh, Jesus taught so much on money and goods and giving. He said, can a, can a man serve two gods? Can a man serve God and mammon? Boy, there's so many people that serve money. You know that? Instead of money being our servant, we become its servant. The, the apostle Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 6. Let's read it. I know I'll forget it. Second Timothy chapter six. I'm sorry, First Timothy. If you find Second Timothy chapter six, we're in trouble. First, First Timothy, chapter six. You got one of them new Bibles if you got that. Okay. Look at this. I start at verse verse one. Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. Now we can say, well, that doesn't apply to us today because we don't have, we don't have servants and masters. Well, we got employees and employers. I spent 33 years of my life working over Allegheny Ludlam Steel Corporation. All right. I wasn't a servant. They paid me. But they were in charge. They were my bosses. Right? I worked for them. This is what it said. And they that have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved partakers of the benefit. These, te these things teach and exhort. Verse 3. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words whereof come envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings. Perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the, tr the truth, supposing the gain is godliness from such withdraw thyself. You will not find these verses quoted in the United Steelworkers magazine. <laughs> okay. For 33 years, I was a member of the United Steelworkers of America. My brother Zar was there too. Okay. We were there. And I kind of thank God because, you know, working in a place like Allegheny Ludham, I don't think I'd want to work here without union. But you know something I found out? This don't line up with what the union teaches. I can remember we went on strike one year. It was, give me, we want more in 94. <laughs> you remember that, brother? We, we, we made on the picket line. We, want, we have t-shirts. We want more in 94. Okay. It says here. See, this, this doesn't go along with modern day thinking. We'll change the topic a little bit, but that's all right. He says, people that, people that deny this, this stuff turn away. They suppose that gain is godliness. There's people that teach in the church today that if you want to be a godly person, you've got to have lots of stuff. And the more stuff you got, the more godly you are. That's a teaching in the church today. That's what they use to raise money. They pump that stuff out. Well, you know, give so much and you'll get so much and God will bless you with this much and that much and this But listen to what Paul says. But godliness with what? Oh. See, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't, you won't find that in the labor union magazine. You won't find that in the, in the self-help books. You won't find that because today they, they, they tell you to never be content where you're at financially. The Apostle Paul says godliness 
with contentment. If you can be godly and you be con- can be content where you're at, that doesn't mean we shouldn't take advantage if an opportunity comes to better ourselves. That doesn't mean we should just try to just stay in one place. But if you can be content, if you can accept where God has you, man, it's quiet in here. If you can accept where, if you can accept where God has you at this time and be godly and be content, that's worth more than all the money in the world. And if you got that kind of attitude, you ain't afraid to give stuff away. You ain't afraid to bless. You ain't afraid to help somebody in need with purpose and responsibility. You're not afraid to take what God has given you and use it for God's glory. He says this. Godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and it's certain we can carry nothing out. We're going through a thing right now. And again, I, my, my friend Zar, my brother Zar here, we were, you know, what year did you retire, Zar? 2003. I retired 2005. When I retired, they said, free health care. I said, hey, praise the Lord. A couple years later, I got a letter in the mail that said, 80 bucks a month. I said, that's pretty good. I mean, you know, still... I, mean, I wasn't counting on that when I retired because they, you know, my, my pension doesn't go up. Well, now they got a new contract. Now it's, it's going to like triple. Hallelujah. My pension ain't tripling. And it's still, you know what, it's still a good deal. It is. I mean, when you look at health care, you know, for what they want to charge for what we got, it's still a good deal. But I was not counting on an extra $280 every month. When I said, I signed on the line, I said, I retire. I'm glad I did retire. But I did. I'm, I'm not, I don't want to go back. But see, those things happen. But you know what? Godliness with contentment, I don't care what they do. I'm going to have to pay it. I don't care what they do. Praise the Lord. They make a 400 bucks a month, 500 bucks a month. Praise the Lord. You know why? Because God's my provider. I'd be content. Godliness with, I'd rather have godliness with contentment, even though there's more money coming out of my pocketbook. I'd rather have godliness with contentment. That's worth more than all the money in the world. I'm not going to get a stomachache over what the, what the United Steelworkers are doing to me. I'm rambling on. For godliness with contentment is great gain. Verse 7. For we brought nothing into this world, and it's certain we can carry nothing out. You leave everything behind. And having, listen, verse 8, and having food and raiment, let us therewith be. I got food, I sure ain't starving. You can tell that by looking at me. And I got clothes on my back. Verse 9, listen to this. And we're, I'm closing, I promise. But they that will be rich, oh, we want to be rich. Have you ever just sat back and thought what it would be like to have, be independently wealthy? Never have to worry about a car payment. Never have to worry about a, you know, an insurance bill. Never have to worry about an electric bill. Never just to sit back and just, you know, you have an accountant somewhere that you know, just does your millions. You know. Sort of like a football player. <laughs> you know, just dip. You know what? That's dangerous. Maybe that's why God never let me have a lot of money. Because he, he knew if I got a lot of money, I'd probably just end up laying in the gutter somewhere. Because he says, they that will be rich fall into a temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. Why? For the love of money. Not money, but the love of it. See, I'm afraid that most of our financial decisions... I'll put myself in it. Most of our financial decisions, most of our decisions about giving or not giving, all revolve around us wanting to have more and being afraid to let go. He said, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Being wealthy is dangerous, money is dangerous. If you don't have the right attitude toward it. See, there's a, there's a lot of wealthy people who are blessed by God. 
And the reason why God blesses them is because they take what they have and they give it away. People that are blessed by God with wealth, there, there's a gift. If you look, read Romans chapter 12, there's a gift of giving. Some people have the gift of giving. If they, if they get a lot of stuff, it's because they give a lot of stuff. And when God gives them more, they'll give more. But those are few and far between. Most of us look at that nest egg. You know, what we got saved up, what we got built up. Just like that man, uh, Jesus told that, that parable in Luke chapter 16 about that fellow that built bigger barns, and he said, oh, look at all my hands have done. And after he got all the big barns built and he looked at all the stuff he had, God said, this night your soul is required. And all that stuff that he had, he had to leave behind so they could fight over it. Verse 11. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay a hold on eternal life whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. It's more important than all the money in the world that you have a rooted faith in Christ. And that you know no matter what happens, economically, you know, people are wringing their hands now because the folks down in Washington can't seem to decide to keep us out of bankruptcy. Wouldn't it be nice if, you know, if the next time, you know, you had a mortgage payment, you could just walk to the bank and sign a paper and say, Here, I think I'll just postpone this for a couple months. That's what they're doing. It's all paper. It's all a bunch of, and that debt clock keeps ticking. Ever see that debt clock? It keeps rolling up and rolling up and rolling up. How did we ever get there? I always believe in trying to live within your means. I always believe you didn't take a loan unless you could pay it. What happened to our government? They're taking loans. They're just, they're just making, they're just printing money. <laughs> Print. The love of money is the root of all evil. Listen, I want, I want to leave you with this, and we're going to close. We're going to pray. I'm sorry for rambling, but that's all right. I'm alive. I think. Don't be afraid when you turn on the news and they start, they start wringing their hands about debt ceilings. They're going to do what they're going to do. My God owns a cattle on a thousand hills. I put, I put a little thing in the, in the, in the, in the uh, bulletin. Now, I may, may not need a cow right now, but he, he owns a lot else too. <laughs> my, God, he, he, my, my God has everything. He has supply of everything. So the government can take a dive. They can go default. They can go bankrupt. People worry about Social Security checks and people worry about everything else. Who's your God? I want to tell you something else. The true, listen, the true believer, and I'm, I'm just going to say this, the true believer in ec economic hard times, they'll rise up with offering, just like they did in Macedonia. Because we're not afraid. I'm not afraid of what the economy does. I'm not afraid of what the Steelworker Union does. I'm not afraid of what they do in Washington or Harrisburg or anywhere. I'm not afraid of the cuts. I'm not afraid of nothing because my God controls it all anyhow. And you know what? I might have to cut out a few steak dinners here or there. <laughs> we don't like that. But that's all right. I sure ain't going to starve. And you're not either. Because my Bible says I've never seen his seed begging for bread. I've never seen the righteous. God will take care of you if you take care of him. Amen? Father, let's pray. Father, I thank you for this word this morning. And I know, Father, it would be a difficult one. But, Lord, in times of trouble... The times that we're living in, economic turmoil and chaos. Father, I pray that you will help us grab a hold of this truth. That if we're your children, you're going to supply our needs. Father, help us learn to be content. 
Help us learn to be willing to accept the place that we are right now where you have us. And be willing to be sensitive to the leading of your spirit. That as you have blessed us with a certain amount of stuff, we're willing to take some of that stuff and give it to others. Supporting the church, supporting people who are needy, supporting people who are hungry, uh, reaching out to those who uh, are struggling. Father, help us be able to reach, reaching out to those in, in other parts of the world that don't even know your name, supporting people who are willing to take their lives and give up everything to go places and preach the gospel, even at the risk of their own lives. Father, help us be willing to take the stuff you've given us and just take a part of it. Father, give us a desire and a hunger to want to bless somebody with the stuff you've given us. We thank you, Lord, for your provision. We thank you, Lord, that you've cared for us, given us places to live, clothes to wear, food to eat. Now, Father, help us be a blessing. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Won't you stand as we close our service?